Welcome everyone to the webinar. This is a very timely topic. There has been two back-to-back -back announcements this week itself. So we're going to go in and talk about digital tracking governance. And if you're a privacy professional or someone who is on the marketing side, what things to look at, how can you comply, what should what should you worry about, you know, how can you have a solution towards this problem as well. And just for everyone's reference, the webinar is being recorded and we will share the recording afterwards. So feel free to, you know, take some notes. If you miss anything, there will be a, a recording that we'll send afterwards. There's all, also a Q&A button right at the bottom you should see on Zoom. So if you have any questions at any point of time, feel free to just put them in the Q&A. We will either pick them then and answer if it's relevant. If it's something that needs to wait for a couple of slides, I will take that up with Daniel as well. And uh, we'll also have some time left towards the end for Q&A. So feel free to put things in Q&A, feel free to use the chat button and you know we'll get started now. So just to begin with, hi everyone, I'm uh, Webhav. We, I am the founder and CEO of Privado. Privado is a privacy code scanning solution which helps companies scan their digital properties like web app, websites, mobile app to figure out what data they collect, all the third parties that are integrated with SDKs, APIs, pixels, and all the data flows that you know, lead to these fines and violation. We integrate deeply into the software development lifecycle to help you find, fix, and prevent any accidental data sharing to advertisers. And yeah, this topic is kind of super related to what we do. So we're going to jump into that pretty soon. Thanks, Daniel, for joining in. Would love uh, your introduction as well. Yeah. And, and again, thank you for having me. So I'm Daniel, chair of the Privacy and Data Security Group at Frankfurt, Kern, and Klein and Cells. Our firm is about 100 lawyers based out of New York and Los Angeles. And everything I deal with is data. SDKs has become a really big issue, as well as pixels and cookies, which most people are familiar with here. But a lot of what we've seen recently is regulation in the app environment. And so, you know, I'm a big advocate of having some type of a technical solution to be able to understand your data flows, which is one reason I'm here by because, you know, I've seen your platform and I'm very interested in it and learning more. And so I'm excited also to be here and, and really see is I believe there's going to be a portion where you're going to guide us through it. That's really helpful for me too. So I'll be talking today about what is the legal landscape? What are the laws? What, what aren't the laws? What are we seeing? What's the trends? It's just a really hot area. And especially if you're a company in a regulated space, so health, children, financial, or with sensitive data sets, this is a particularly relevant webinar because there's so many takeaways to be thinking about right now. It's just, it, it's the space is moving so quickly. So again, thank you for having me. Awesome. Thanks, Daniel. And just to kind of pick on where you left, yeah, we're going to first start with what really is digital tracking and what is governance look, looking like when you use tracking or marketing, which I'm assuming like if you are a company, of course, like one of the main goal is to make money and, you know, marketing is something that your company would be doing. So pretty much everyone does some level of marketing or advertising. So as privacy professionals, how can you ensure you can have the marketing without the privacy risk? So that's kind of the, you know, what the topic we're going to talk today. And Daniel will, of course, touch upon the regulatory and enforcement landscape, how it looks in the US as he was talking about how things are changing. It's, it's very fast moving. We'll also look at some recent examples and again, focus more on the learnings rather than a particular example. And then, yeah, we'll end with some resources for all of you and also a demonstration of how Privado can actually help you achieve that. Perfect. So I know today's topic is digital tracking governance. I've heard like various, you know, terminologies around it as, you know, people have been speaking about that, like marketing governance or ad tracking governance or, you know, digital tracking governance being one of them as well. I, you know, wanted to start with from a simple context of just breaking it down itself into what does tracking mean, you know, as a company, when you're looking at as a privacy professional, what are you dealing with? And then jump into the governance aspect, right? So, yeah, I mean, like from a tracking perspective, it's simply, as I said, if you are a company, your goal is even you are a B2B or a B2C company is to get more money. And one of the ways to do that is to actually market or target your users that are visiting your websites or your mobile app. And that happens through 
a lot of technologies. I think on the marketing side, the technology stack has become really sophisticated over time. SDKs, APIs, pixels, cookies. Yeah. So we were uh, talking about the digital tracking part, which is there are these, the marketing stack has become super sophisticated and there are these, and the reasons are different, right? To retarget users, target similar users, measure campaigns. So the first question I had for you, Daniel, was in terms of when we're looking at tracking or marketing initiatives, what are the ones that as privacy professionals, we need to care about more? Are there specific marketing activities to look forward to? So let, let's kind of start with a primer here by what we even mean by tracking or the technologies that we're looking at. And as you mentioned, you have here in the lower, the bottom left of the slide, SDKs, APIs, cookies, pixels, the, track, the technologies through which data is collected. But we're, we're really talking about that when somebody visits a website, the brand or whoever's managing that site wants to know something about the user, right? Or maybe not even about the user themselves, but about the device. And it's not just for marketing. Marketing is the thing that most of us are, you know, because there's a lot of focus on that from regulatory enforcement. Marketing is what most people are focused on, but there's so many other ancillary technologies and basis for this. So it might be for purposes of analytics. It might be for purposes of fraud prevention or detection. So generally what happens is a company uses these third-party technologies. And the reason you use these other technologies is it's really no different than think about like if you're building a product in the back end, you don't want to have to build every single component. So you're going to use different pieces of different technologies. You're going to use open source you're going to license the technologies. This really is not that different. You're basically licensing a technology, putting it onto your web environment or in your app environment to allow facilitation of these elements. As I mentioned, fraud prevention analytics. And then of course, there's a bunch of stuff that comes with advertising that is not just the display of the ad itself, but is around like measurements, conversion tracking, making sure that there's not fraud or, or bots with respect to, you, you want to make sure everything is correct, that you're getting paid correctly. So the point is that it, it's a very sophisticated ecosystem. And I stress that this is different than, and we can talk about this in a bit, like the do not sell and other obligations for opt-outs generally targeted advertising, because those apply not just to this type of technology, the trackers, that's everything. That's data that's also in your CRM, email addresses, phone numbers. Most of the stuff we're not talking about. This is what we're talking about. A lot, a lot of times you hear business saying, this data is anonymous, can't identify anybody, right? And we know from regulators that that is just not an accurate perspective now of what the law is saying, that the expectation that this law is considered personal, that this data is considered personal. And so when we're thinking about it as, as part of a holistic analysis, and this goes to your governance question, a company really needs to understand everything it's doing from its collection through these types of trackers on its website. And so what that requires is really full understanding of data flows and building out a robust program. I, I, I really do think this, like that you need to have a whole system in place to be evaluating this. And Historically, there really hasn't been anything like this. It's always kind of been piecemeal where you have one person who's responsible for embedding this technology for marketing. You have one person who's responsible for embedding this technology for analytics. You have a different person who's responsible for privacy. You have a different person who's responsible for security. And the idea about governance to me is that it's bringing everything together under one structure to understand mm -hmm. or governance to really be able to understand what the obligations are, what the company is doing, and how to holistically come up with a perspective for moving forward. Yeah, awesome. And that's a great point, right? I mean, if you have your digital properties, your apps and websites, there'll be different teams owning different outcomes. Some like your product team is concerned about analytics. Of course, your marketing team is looking at advertising. And then there's someone in the fraud prevention team who's using like some technology for fingerprinting to prevent fraud. So while they are, you know, teams in your distributed teams in your company, governance, you made like a strong point, like goes all the way up to privacy, where you need at least one central view of all the technologies and which of them are under sell slash shares, which of these could still have concerns of external data sharing, you know, which could be like an FTC 
uh, violation based on your privacy policy because that goes even beyond advertising flows, right? So I think, yeah, what you said is completely perfect. Like governance is about like one central view of all these distributed way of adding more technology and third parties to your mobile app and website. And even like, as you said, server side to CRM as well. Perfect. So kind of jumping in just to kind of set up the context on, on even the webinar and why, you know, this has become such an important topic. Daniel would love your kind of, from your experience, both on the regulatory side or on the enforcement side, what are you really uh, seeing? There have been multiple cases also happening. So would love if you can educate the, the, the members here today. Yeah, of course. So I think this is a good snapshot of what we've seen in the last few years. And, and this is just in the United States. If we get into Europe, it's a whole different uh, <laughs> complexity. But in the U.S., we've seen a number of actions over the last few years and generally focused on, and I actually think that's your next slide, right? Talking about some of the actions that we've seen dealing with regulatory scrutiny for these types of technologies. In the U.S., going way back, so we really haven't had a ton of regulation in the U.S. specifically around tracking technologies historically. And so this is my kind of primer here, 101. We don't have anything that's comparable to GDPR. We don't have a large, we don't have a comprehensive privacy law. So for the most part, regulation has been either on the state level or has been at the sectoral level for certain types of sensitive data sets, referencing like health, children's data, um, and so even going before this, 2020 is when we had got the CCPA, which was the first comprehensive state law. But before that, we had a few state laws that dabbled in this, I would say. So California had a state law, which many people may be familiar here that require disclosures around do not track or DNT, mm -hmm. but it didn't actually say you had to do anything. It just said you have to disclose what you're doing with respect to do not track signals. And there was Calopa. And so again, that's going back a long time. And then really where the first laws that I can think of that, that really regulate this specifically, like COPPA is one of them, right? And it's dealing with children. And if you look at what the FTC's position has been in their FAQ, it says you can't collect personal information from children under 13 without verifiable parental consent, which extends to, on, to websites and online services. Um, and so that has been an area that for many years has been a concern, talking about what data can you actually collect through a website, through trackers, where the website is directed toward kids. And we can talk more about that. So there's been dramatic change in the last several years. We now have California. We now have, I believe, upon my last review, we are now going to be at 17 states, including California, that have comprehensive privacy laws. Most of those states have obligations around opting out of targeted advertising, processing of personal data for targeted advertising, which uh, the types of processing that we're talking about here would, would likely fall underneath that. For purposes of California, they have these definitions of opting out of sales or shares, which have been interpreted to essentially be targeted advertising, disclosing data through trackers, to third parties. And that's very important to note by because what I what I think is one of the one of the big takeaways that we've seen is that it doesn't necessarily need to be targeted advertising. Like if you're doing you're using trackers, but it's outside the scope of targeted advertising, but you're not protected by a contract that mm -hmm. makes the recipient a service provider, that still can be a sale under the law. And so, you know, that's that's actually what we saw partially under Sephora, where they actually referenced the analytics through pretty analytics providers that perhaps did not have restrictions on how the data could be used. Um, and then you have, so general consumer protection law, you have the FTC, Section 5 authority, you also have state consumer protection laws. And this has been an area that we've seen actually a lot of activity in the last several years since the Biden administration came into power a few years ago. The FTC has become much more stringent 
and has been looking to actively regulate companies and especially in sensitive data sectors, you know, against health, financial, with location data, we can talk about some of the stuff we've seen there. And then we've seen some states take very prescriptive measures to say, we're actually going to add our own state laws that are going to be really nuanced around certain types of data. And I think the good example that you have here is the Washington My Health, My Data Act, which essentially regulates tracking technology that's collecting health data in Washington from Washington residents. But the definition of health data is so broad that it could arguably capture a lot of stuff. And with that law, so most of these things are are regulated by the attorney general's office or by a regulator, by the FTC. That one actually get, allows for private right of action, which is a really risky area. And so we're, we're waiting to see, like that just took effect at the end of March. And so we're waiting to see what that's gonna look like. The other thing that I think is important to note here that's not on the list are private rights of action separately and like laws where we're seeing a lot of litigation. So I actually did a whole webinar yesterday on like SEPA and wiretapping law, which has mm -hmm. been an area that we're just seeing so much, so much litigation. I think a lot of those are frivolous cases. They're kind of shakedowns, but courts have allowed them to proceed for now. And then there's also other areas like VPPA, the Video Privacy Protection Act. So websites that have video viewership data, if they're collecting data through trackers there, that they also could implicate the VPPA. And that has a private right of action and a large and a plaintiff's bar that's very aggressively pursuing those actions. So that's kind of the lay of the land. And by the way, that is just, that's the regulation. Outside of regulation, there's self-regulation. And mm -hmm. self-regulation has been efforts by industry to try to address some of these issues. And so I, I, IEB has really been on the forefront of this over the last few years. You also have NAI, you have DAA that have been really pushing those are part of the advertising ecosystem. And then the last thing I want to mention, and we can talk more about this later, are the platform requirements. So platforms themselves impose restrictions around how data can be collected. So Apple with iOS has done a lot over the years. They created an identifier. Basically, if you go back to the early 2010s, um, companies used to be able to get a lot of data from the device. And so then Apple, in a way to restrict that, said, well, you're only allowed to collect something called an ad ID. And that essentially, the idea is that that was a resettable ID that users, that you know, companies could use in a way, but that users could reset so that it would give them choice over their data. Um, a few years ago, we then saw Apple come up with a new regime, an updated version, I believe is in iOS 14, which allow, which basically requires opt-in consent if you're going to get one of those ad IDs for purposes of targeted advertising, targeting. And Apple has its own definition of what targeting is, which is very robust. And again, there's there's a lot of questions and ambiguity around that too. So, and then of course, the last thing I'll mention is that there's been this discussion about Google over the last several years and Chrome and the deprecation of the third party cookie and what's that gonna look like? Like, are we not gonna have cookies anymore? Cookies are a different technology and by maybe you can talk about some of the differences in the technologies later. But they keep saying that they are going to, by default, not allow Chrome to, to process these, these third-party cookies, allow them to be dropped. But they keep pushing the deadline back and they they have some solutions, but there's questions about antitrust with their solutions as opposed to cookie to these third-party cookies. And so we're still waiting. And I think the time frame for that is somewhere at the end. The proposed time frame is potentially at the end of 2024. So with all that stuff, that's that's the lay of the land. There's a lot of complexity, as you can <laughs> see. Yeah, and just on the fact on the platform uh, that you said, like Apple all, also has a new requirement called Apple Privacy Manifest Report, right? So that has to be now part of not only app developers, but also SDK. So they're also fixing the entire supply chain privacy problem that, you know, like you can add an SDK and then that SDK could have issues. So they have actually mandated some SDKs to have signatures and manifest reports. And then every Apple developer has to have the same. And then they actually extended your, just to add to your point on device data being collected, there are some, restri not restricted, but there are some Apple APIs that if you are collecting some level of data, like file stamp, user default, you have to actually, as an as a Apple developer, declare the purpose. 
And if you don't, then actually your app gets rejected. So we've been seeing with our customers as we speak, they're getting these app, you know, rejection mails and they're actually able to use that provider for that as well. So we'll, we'll probably touch on that. Yeah, moving on again, like I think recently, at least over the last this week itself, there have been more enforcements or actions by the FTC. I think my broader question to you, like Daniel, is like, what are the learnings like for a privacy professional just to who's trying to say, okay, we are going to do marketing. What should we do? What what would you suggest are the learnings for them? So when we look at all these cases, well, first off, all the FTC cases you've put in have one thing in common, and that's they all relate to health data or data and broadly defined health data, right? Anything that could even, they could potentially could identify the past, present, or future health condition of an individual. And in GoodRx, BetterHelp, Easy Healthcare, or Freemom. And then these other two that just came out, I actually just looked at them before this. All of these are very similar pattern, fact patterns where they say, a company was offering something that was a health service, but that was not regulated technically by HIPAA. And HIPAA is the health law that most of us think of, oh yeah, of course HIPAA protects our data, but really it only protects data, patient data, where the entity is a covered entity, right? And that's usually like a hospital or, or something in that realm, like insurance. But for all these apps that consumers are using, where they may be providing data that could be considered health data or data that's inferred inferences around health data, that data is not protected by HIPAA. And so in the scope of since Dobbs and post Roe v. Wade, there's been a huge concern that health data is no longer protected, that individuals don't have as many rights around their health data. So that's why we're seeing this. This is not a coincidence that all this started right in February 2023 or, or these actions became public then last year. And I've been following this very closely. I think the takeaway on all of these cases is that if you are a company that is dealing with any type of health data, so like, you know, you could be a gym app, for example, and like weights and all these different things that are working out, you need to be really careful about what technology you're betting, embedding within your app environment, because all of these alleged that these companies had technology in their app environment some of which were SDKs, some of which was, were pickled, pixels. And again, we can talk about the difference between some of these technologies. And then we're sharing this data with third parties, sometimes ad networks or, you know, some of the large platforms like Facebook or Snap or TikTok. And we're then serving ads to people based on the data that was being collected that was sensitive to them. And the FTC has said, this is an unfair and deceptive practice. It's unfair because users would not expect this. And it's deceptive because they made statements in their privacy policies that we will never share your health data with anyone, but here they are sharing their health data. So mm -hmm. it's just, it, this is this to me, and by the way, this aligns with the privacy laws that we've seen that say, if you're going to share sensitive data, you need opt-in consent. And what makes Washington so tough to deal with is that Washington's definition of opt-in consent is such a higher burden than yeah. any other jurisdiction because it has to be a very specific authorization. It has to be in writing. So I would argue that in Washington, you know, this is probably prohibited. It's effectively a prohibition. And that's that question is for companies. It's like, whoa, are we just not going to roll this out in Washington? Do we geo restrict it? But again, I think these align with everything else. Now, Sephora is a little different. Sephora deals specifically with California privacy law. And, and there was a more recent action, DoorDash, which is similar in ways too, but Sephora really dealt with, with the tracking technologies. And Sephora said that if you're gonna engage in targeted advertising, you need to disclose it within your privacy policy. You need to have contracts with companies that you work with, binding them to restrictions around their data use you need to have an opt-out. And in order, as part of that opt-out, there's a few things that California privacy law requires. One, you have to basically disclose the opt-out in your privacy policy. Two, you have to have it in the footer of your website, an easy way for somebody to click on it and opt out. And then you also have to have something that uh, is part of that opt-out that responds to GPC, general global privacy control, that essentially browsers 
have the ability that a user can go in, check a box in a browser and say, hey, I, I automatically don't want you to be engaging in targeted advertising in these activities. And the idea is that the website has to be able to get that, process that, and then automatically allow for the opt-out. Now, most on this call probably have not seen that. And the reason why we haven't seen that so much is that a lot of the large browsers don't have that, like Safari doesn't have it. And most of that is through a plugin, right? We've seen third-party plugins offered. Now, there is a proposed amendment right now the California privacy law that would make it a requirement for browsers to offer this opt-out. Mm -hmm. So I, I keep saying it's a matter of time. Like, I don't know, we'll see what happens when Apple has its developers conference this year, but I, I keep waiting for them to make an announcement that GPC is now part of their, their, you know, environment. And that when somebody first comes on, it's going to ask, Hey, do you want to turn this on? Do you want to turn it off? So it's going to be really interesting because once that happens, I do think it'll have a very big impact on the ability to deploy some of these technologies on sites. And, and so in the Sephora case, they found that, you know, Sephora had not rolled this out and, and that's what resulted in this, this fine. Yeah. And I think from a, one interesting thing or pattern I could see across all these actions, again, not picking on any specific thing, but like a general trend is essentially I mean, the regulator is especially like gotten sophisticated enough that they in their articles are talking about pixels, API events, con conversion API, SDKs, event name, list names, right? So, I mean, they are almost at the same parallel of the sophistication of your marketing stack. So it's basically becomes really important for the privacy teams to have this, for that governance to have the same visibility into the marketing tech stack, which can affect these privacy cases, right? So I think that's, that was a, that's such a surprising thing as well, that if you actually read the FTC post, they actually are going into detail about, hey, here was the name of the event, which actually revealed health data, or there was a Facebook API, conversion API, which was integrated. And they also talk about hashed emails being shared. And, you know, hashing is not a technology, technology which can, you know, kind of prevent data sharing because the hashing technology is the platform. So they will re, they can easily identify, right? So... On the regulator side, they have that sophistication of looking at pixels, APIs, SDKs. And, and that brings me to the next slide is kind of what are the key challenges, you know, now going from we've kind of understood what we're talking about and what the lay of the land is. But when it comes to actually like getting into that governance, getting that complete 360 degree picture, here are the three things or here are the three big challenges that we see, you know, the first thing as you know, Daniel, you were mentioning is about, hey, you first need to figure out that on your properties, and we're right now just talking about mobile app and website. If you look at server side, that's another big, you know, you know, big thing that we can discuss, but just on those two sides, your apps and websites, the, the way or multiple teams would end up integrating these technologies, as we said, marketing product, maybe fraud prevention, and it happens via different technologies. So SDKs, APIs, picks, uh, there are, you know, uh, beacons, you could have cookies in there, which is probably like everyone would be uh, aware of. And I think the, the least talked about generally is SDK. So, and I know Daniel, you did like a big post on SDK, especially. So I just wanted to get your sense on working with companies. What are the challenges you have faced when trying to get like an SDK inventory or SDK data flow inventory in general? Yeah, no, that's, that's great. And so I, so SDKs, let's talk about it for one second, like what an SDK is, right? SDK is a software development kit, and it is essentially a, a form of technology that is made available by another company. So let's just give an example. Meta has its SDK, and you want to get a certain functionality. And as I said, you don't want to build it yourself because it's too expensive to build it yourself, and this other company can provide a better functionality. And so you go on and you're able to license that SDK from them. And usually the way that happens is it's it's usually a pretty simple process. You don't even realize what you're agreeing to. This is what happens is, you know, you log into a platform. It says, okay, download our SDK. You agree to our terms of service. Sure, we agree to the terms of service. And now you have access to this. It's some code. You put the code into your environment. And Vibe, you probably know so much more than I do about the technical implementation of that, but it gets embedded within your environment. And now that it's in your environment, it lives there and it is you're able to use functionality that that 
third party provides within your environment. So a great example would be, you know, again, you, you want to have meta in there because you want to use meta login. You might activate this SDK so that it allows you to have this login functionality. Now, what we've found, we've, we've done a lot of research and diligence in this over the last few years, just because we've been dealing with regulatory enforcement in this space. This is definitely an area, as you mentioned, that regulators are focused on and are getting very sophisticated and have their own vendors that are looking at. What we found is like, you know, you can use one SDK for many functionalities. And I think that is a really complex element, right? So takeaway number one for me is that when you're you're embedding your SDKs and you're, un, you're trying to understand like what you're doing with your SDKs, the data flows only talk about so much, but there's actually, there may be things that through the platform itself can be activated, different functionalities. So yeah. like you might be able to say, okay, we're going to activate login and we're going to activate analytics mm -hmm. and we're going to activate marketing. So sometimes an SDK is put in there for one reason and then another team goes, oh yeah, look, we have access to this. And then they log in because they have the credentials and they activate it. And then you don't even realize that it's been activated, right? And then all, and so, and we, I've seen that before where you're, you believe, oh yeah, like we know all the purposes for which it's being used, but like you really don't know all the purposes. Adding on to that for one second within these environments. So you actually, an SDK can be a, a hub so that another third party can actually be looped in for that SDK. And I know I'm not using all the, the proper, you know, legal or technical jargon here, but you can do like an activation sometimes through a yep. platform where you log in and you go, okay, again, just an example, I'm using, you know, the meta login functionality, but I want to go and I want to, I want to connect in a specific, a third party ad network to it. And mm -hmm. some of these will allow you to activate a third party ad network where you can click a button and now that's embedded. So you actually have multiple parties that are getting data through this SDK environment that you didn't even realize was happening. So again, this gets very tricky very quickly, which is why I think there's so much confusion. And the big thing that we found that was a problem around it is that it is not transparent. It is really, really tough to understand what is happening. And cookies are much easier to understand because cookies are these kind of archaic technologies that have been around forever on the internet that when they're dropped, you know, they drop on the browser, they live on the browser, you can see what's being collected from them. For the most part, they interact with a pixel and they send data back to the pixel. But there's a lot of vendor solutions out there that allow for that. And one reason why like, I like talking to you about this is that Privato has one of the only solutions that I've seen that seems to me that it can get a good feeling for what's going on in the SDK environment. So that's that's where we have really been, you know, over the last few years, really an increased focus in the last year around it. And I fully anticipate we're going to see a lot more scrutiny around SDKs in the coming years. Awesome. No, thanks for that. And and you were actually pretty spot on these activations can lead to multiple layered SDKs and SDK adding another SDK adding another SDK. So that's pretty normal in the, again, as I said, the marketing stack or because that has increased a lot, the spends are a lot there. So a lot of technology investment has happened by third party companies to build these sophisticated technologies, SDKs for marketing. And they do offer, you know, put our SDK and we'll handle the 20 SDKs on our own. Right. So that happens a lot on the website, the, the best example of that is tag managers, Google tag managers, Telium, where you will add just tag manager and someone can just go in and switch on another tag from there. And there's no code change needed and there's no governance there. So that's pretty sprout on. So yeah, so the first big challenge is this inventory. The main thing here is it's not just possible to scan your website outside and then get this because there's the website and there's the app. And then all of them use these multiple technologies to so just to get to a place where you have the inventory of what is my list of third party integrated into these assets digital assets like website and app is a big challenge the second biggest data flow and this is something which i've seen multiple times referred in ftc like this thing called event names you know uh, an analytic event was sent to someone now again I, in my previous avatar i was actually working in product a very normal thing for a product manager or someone working in product is to measure the new feature they released, did it work or not? What's the adoption of that feature? And this comes to a point of user journeys. So think of like an e-commerce store, you go and you add something in a cart. The moment you add something in cart, someone will actually fire an event saying cart added with the name of the product and send it to everywhere. They'll send it to their 
Google Analytics to track how many cart, how many items are being added to cart, which item. They'll also send it to pixels. And why will they send it to pixel is because so when you visit any third website, they can retarget you and say, hey, you were looking for mattress. Here are 10 mattresses. You know, I'm sure everyone has experienced that, you know, shopped on e-commerce stores and went to news channel and just you, you're seeing mattress ads for, I don't know, 10, 20 days, right? So that entire concept of mimicking user's journey and sending events to analytics platform, advertising platforms happens a lot. And because this is super complex in the sense that it's happening in the code, decision made by someone on the product and engineering side, that visibility becomes really difficult to get. And out of, let's say, 100 such user journeys, maybe five of them can reveal health data. And that leads to, you know, a breach. And that leads to, you know, being added into the FTC's enforcement as well. So that's why the data flows are a little complex. There are two, three complexity. One is what you decide to share. There could be accidental data sharing. And third, like what Daniel mentioned, there are configuration. like. Basically, depending on how you configure these SDKs, they can take more data or less data. So that also, but for even to reach that place, you need visibility on inventory and then figure out what data is actually flowing to these pixels, SDKs, third parties. The other, the thing that you just said that was really interesting was talking about, you know, these buckets of when you send this, you know, like the abandoned cart or whatever, and you're sending what, what happened here. We, we've seen if you look at some of these FTC enforcements, they talk specifically around how the companies and, and these companies arguably were whoever it was, was a bad actor at the time or just made some very bad mistakes. Like, for example, they labeled these things as like health condition one, right? Like it actually labeled it, oh, this person is diabetic and diabetic abandoned cart or the name of a specific you know, like medication or something. And that's a huge issue. Like that's actually something that you can work on because if you, if you're labeling things in a way that's like defining it as something that's sensitive, then the FTC is going to say that's sensitive. I, I think that they probably could have prevented some of these things from happening if they had just labeled it saying like instance one or something like that. So that's, that's another good takeaway is like, just be really careful in your labeling with yeah. events sharing because it can just like the actual labeling itself, or if you're doing segment creation, like mm -hmm. don't label a segment diabetic users, right? Like it's better to say men between these ages that do X, Y, and Z or whatever. Like that, that to me seems a really, you know, really simple way to help reduce your risk. Yeah. And to your point, uh, which brings to the last challenge is basically the thing is none of this is static right? Your, I mean, two third organizations are actually shipping software once a month, actually pretty much every day, every other week, which means these event names will keep changing. And that's the place where even if someone is like genuinely just trying to measure, they could lead to the sensitive data sharing because they don't know the context of, hey, if you name this, this could actually reveal health data and teams change, even if you train. So that becomes a big problem, which brings us kind of to the next part of the webinar, which is how do you solve it and how Privado actually helps you solve it, right? And and our mantra is like, it the on the marketing side, you have the best sophisticated tech stack. You need a technology which on the privacy side as well to actually solve for it. And uh, the way Privado solves it are, are on three sides. So, so first of all, Privado is a privacy code scanning solution that syncs your privacy compliance requirements with your product development requirements. Your engineering teams, your product teams are shipping software at lightning speed every other day, every week, two third, at least once a month. We will put privacy at exactly at the same speed. We help you do three things. We help you get an accurate picture of your data and data inventory. We help you make privacy governance programmatic, which means automated privacy checks in your software development lifecycle. And finally, we help your engineers do the right thing when they name an event as Daniel was mentioning, which could reveal health data, we give them a guidance to rename that so the mistakes don't happen. So find, fix, and prevent. And the three key capabilities from a digital tracking governance that Privado can help you achieve. One is, the first one is just to get that 360 degree view of marketing tech stack, which is where we started about digital tracking governance. The first is, what are the third parties that are integrated in your mobile app and website? The SDK inventory, the pixel inventory, the API inventory, all of it. However it is integrated, we'll give you the list. Second is tagging all the sensitive data. And finally, building that end-to-end -end picture of what data you're collecting and what data goes to these marketing tech stack, building that full data flow graph. 
The second big thing uh, that Privado will help you achieve is consent compliance checks. So continuously auditing your website and app and saying, hey, did the banner you configure you know, six months back, is it still working or has it stopped working? Are the GPC checks passing or are they not passing, right? All of that, we actually will automatically check on your mobile app and website to ensure you have continuous consent compliance. And finally, again, as I said, things are not static. These things will keep changing, which means you will have new event names being labeled, new SDKs being added, new configuration changes. And Privado will be a continuous check in your software development lifecycle, kind of like continuously auditing, monitoring, and giving you feedback that, hey, this is some this is a new ad SDK, it needs approval, or we need to define it, or here is a sensitive data sharing, let's prevent it from going live and fix it before you know we face a breach or a fine later. So helping you get inventory, helping you monitor consent, and then finally preventing these things from happening. We have a ton of resources. Again, as I said, like actually this conversation started, I connected with Daniel in the first place by reading his amazing blog post around SDKs and data flows. That was something which was very well informed. So I would recommend everyone to go through that. We'll share these resources later. And there are more amazing resources from FKK that you know I would definitely recommend. And we have some on Privado side as well that we will share across. Next, I'm going to go into the demo and I'll leave some time for Q&A as well. So there's a question around how do we audit mobile apps for these pixels? So I'm going to answer it live right away as I move into the demo. So thanks for asking that question. Perfect. Daniel, real quick, can you see the Privado dashboard? Awesome. Perfect. Thanks for that. Great. So again, just for everyone's memory, we are going to focus on that one use case, digital tracking governance or ad tech governance. Privado will connect to your source code management tool to scan your websites, mobile apps code, and give you complete visibility. So I'm going to start with the, the biggest breach as per all articles, which was the meta pixel breach. Uh, either you are integrating the meta SDK or pixels on your website and apps. And one question as privacy team we want to get is, show me all my pixels, show me all my SDK. So here's a list of all that. But then the next question you really want to answer is, if I have Facebook login or if I have Facebook pixel, what data Facebook is getting? Answering that question in Privado is super easy. You just click here and it will true data flow diagram from your code. And this is true because it's coming from the code. It's scanning the code. It's not relying on assessment. It's not relying on human input. It is giving you the picture of what is actually integrated in your mobile app and website and gives you one complete picture of, hey, this is all what you're sharing with Facebook, right? So in this case, in our account, gender, purchase history, device identifier, illness or medical condition, we're going to look at that next. We're going to investigate how email address and order details are being shared. Now, as I said, the FTC really focused on this specific flow, which is illness or medical condition to Facebook. And we have a specific Android app called Leaky Health app, which is sharing that. So why don't we do one thing? We move to this app itself, an Android app, which is called Leaky Health app. And it has, let's look at all the cases. Let's look at what we discover, the inventory, and, and what are the privacy issues that we can see here. So first of all, Android app, we can see a nice data flow diagram. It has a lot of SDKs integrated in it, AdMob, Analytics, Firebase, Mixpanel, Facebook, Branch. So we're going to investigate that. You can also see there are some uh, permissions that this app takes. So it takes Bluetooth and phone state. So that's something to look at as well. And then let's start from the first picture. The first thing it will help you figure out is as an app, either direct or observed, what is the data that you're collecting, right? So you're, for example, in this app, purchase history is being collected, device identifier, IoT, advertising identifier, gender, and illness or medical condition. Now, this is something which is super sensitive under GDPR, of course, under CPRA, and consumer health data under My Health, My Data Act as well. The second thing we do is we build you an accurate inventory of all your third parties. So for example, in this mobile app, there are these SDKs which are integrated. Google Firebase, Amplitude, Mixpanel, AdMob, Facebook, and Branch. These are all SDKs with different purposes. And you know, as you know, Daniel started, Amplitude is by the product team, Firebase by the engineering team, AdMob and Facebook and Branch by your advertising or marketing team. Now, when we were looking at the last flow, one of the things we wanted to investigate was why is Facebook getting this data type for illness or medical condition? And once you run Privado, that will be a question for you to ask as well. Hey, 
Okay, now Privado has tell us illness or medical condition is being shared. What do we do next? So one of the great things about our tool is we actually have a view which is called code analysis. This is a view which becomes really handy when you are saying, okay, why are we sharing gender with uh, Facebook and how, then it gives you an exact line by line proof of that. So for example, in this case, here's why, here's how gender flowed from your app to Facebook. There was a variable called gender, which became part of this thing called parameters. Again, this is something your engineers will understand. This is something to bridge that gap when you're going to engineers. It went all the way here to this line called logger.log .log event. And if you just read this comment, which we added on top of it is com.facebook.app event logger, which is Facebook SDK, which is Facebook getting data of gender. The same thing is in lesser medical condition where it started with a variable called therapy taken. Again, therapy taken, this is a health app, you know, being collected, but during the uh, event journey, this health uh, therapy taken variable got transformed and, you know, all the way down, it again became part of this SDK called Facebook. So here is a line by line proof of what you do when you find these issues. You can actually send it to your engineers to fix it so you don't have these issues in production, right? So that's how the data flow engine of Privada works. We will A, scan your mobile app and website to build the data element inventory, build the third party inventory, and then give you the data flows, especially the problematic one as well. Secondly, a big portion of Privado is to operationalize your policies. So I'm going to take an example of CPRA do not sell or share disclosure as an example. Everyone has to say, okay, what is the data type you're sharing? And I'm going to take an example and say, let's look at this issue, which is I-14. So what Privado will do is we'll take your public facing privacy promises and say, this is what you have disclosed. And that becomes a policy in Privado. If we find any data flow that violates this policy, it will create an issue that engineers can fix. So think of classically in privacy, you create privacy risk register by doing assessment. Privado creates this risk automatically just by our code scan. So here's an issue that Privado found. We detected gender was being shared with Facebook, but as per the CPRA disclosure, you could only share online identifiers. So either you need to change your privacy policy or fix this flow. If you want to fix this flow, here is a line by line proof. You can just click here and send it to Jira, assign it to the engineer, they will fix it. Or if you have to update your privacy policy, then that's an option as well. You know, either way, Privado helps you figure out your gaps in, the, in your public facing privacy promises all the way to an exact line of code in your mobile app or website. And that's how the entire uh, process works. So you get the inventory, you get the issues. And then in the future, when your engineers make some changes, we will also find them. So let me take an example of that. In this case, let's take an example here. In this case, an engineer was trying to add a new pixel called TikTok. Privado actually discovered it and gave engineer a feedback that, hey, you're trying to add this new integration. Please go through the legal review and then only you can go live. It's actually pretty cool. Engineers actually see this in their workflow. So if you're, if you're seeing the screen, this is where engineers spend their time. And the cool thing is Privado on privacy's behalf will give them a feedback there saying, hey, we found that you're trying to add this new third party called TikTok. You can do that, but all you need to do is go on this link and fill this privacy review. And once we have approved it, then only you can actually go live. So basically it makes privacy super accessible and part of your software development life cycle. So here was an example of a third party. You can make sure all the agreements are signed, it's approved, and then only this can go live. So that's the prevention part of Privado. So again, just to take a step back, Privado will help you find, fix, and prevent any accidental data sharing to advertisers and help you operationalize digital tracking governance. With that, I think there are a bunch of questions in the Q&A, so I'm going to uh, stop sharing and then, you know, start picking those up. So yeah, there is a question around how is Privado different from website scanning, so I'm going to, going to pick that up. So yeah, again, we can answer it in two ways. One is like website scanning has been there since, I don't know, at least 2016 when, or even before that, when GDPR came, everybody wanted a cookie banner. So I think everyone at least is scanning their website for cookies. But the thing, one big gap, which Daniel pointed rightly was SDKs, which sits in mobile apps. So that's one big kind of gap in the privacy program or your governance program for trackers. 
The second big problem we see even in websites, as I was talking about that journey of someone adds an item on the cart and then, you know, that reveals health data that cannot be scanned from a website because outside in, you cannot replicate how a user is going to perform and what data is going to go. That journey is, that business logic is in your code. So you need to scan the code for that. So that's how... That's why you need to scan your code and website scanning is not enough. That's why we are continuously seeing these breaches and fines. There are actually two more questions. One is around, uh, with, would provider work on source code in SAP, which is closed or front-end code based on it? Yeah, Abhishal, pretty much anything which is checked, we, we can scan. We've scanned these kind of code, especially the HTML one that's pretty straightforward. We can... We can scan those and give you a pixel inventory as well. And which line of defense would this fall into in? Is it risk management or? So yeah, Daniel, actually, that's a great question for you as well. I mean, how do companies, when they're trying to mature, and I've been getting these questions a lot on, hey, our priorities is to solve for this collision between privacy and advertising. What? How should companies think in terms of where should they put them under risk, privacy? What's your opinion or what's your experience yeah. being? Yeah. So, so first off, I thank you for that demonstration. I always love seeing it. I think it's really helpful. And as just a, I think important for the audience to know, like Bravado is a, an amazing technical solution. The way that I look at it is as part of your risk analysis, right? Is you're using that as a technical solution. You also have to work with your lawyers to look at the the legal risk itself and then take those two things together. So, you know, one thing we've had an issue with over the years is it's like, okay, lawyers help us interpret what our obligations are. I can tell you what your obligations are. It's really hard for me to operationalize that. And so that's what this tool does. This tool helps us see it. So for example, I think it's a great idea to run a scan here, get it, and then go, hey, we're going to give this to our lawyers to see what this means, what may be the impact of it. Because even though the product is identifying and say, yeah, we think this is likely a CPRA violation you know, you really have to speak with legal about that. So that's that's why we work very closely together. And I think that it's a, it's a really, really terrific resource. With respect to risk management, all of this goes together for risk management, right? Everything that we're talking about is about the risk management. And so we're seeing a lot of laws now that have come into effect and expectations around conducting due diligence, understanding what is in your ecosystem, understanding about your vendors. We're going to see a lot more of this in the next few years. I expect this will be one of the large areas that regulators are focused on. And honestly, this has been an issue that I've had is that dealing with regulator inquiries, what we've seen has been regulators coming to us, to a client saying, hey, or to a company saying, hey, like we wanna understand what your data flows are. Tell us, what are you doing? We wanna see your contracts and all of this. And like, you're kind of stuck in the place where you go, oh, we don't even know, you know, we have to assemble everything. And, right. and what we've seen historically is, and there's a lot of reasons for that, right? Because governance, this whole concept about governance from the top down for most companies has not been built into their, into the ecosystem. And this is one issue that I've, I've seen is that, that I have is IT, right? Security is something that's considered like a pillar of the organization, but we don't have a pillar of the organization for privacy. We don't have a pillar of an organization around these trackers. AI is another one that's upcoming right now. Like we don't have a pillar around AI. And so everything is reactionary. It goes, okay, we're going to react as this happens. And so all of this goes into your risk profile. If you build these systems, if you have active scans, and then you see, take this scan, then you run an impact assessment on it to say, okay, let's take a look at it. Then this, this goes into the impact assessment. You know, what's the processing operation? What are the data flows? How is this being used? And what measures are we taking? And then based on those measures, do we feel comfortable proceeding? And I think like without having a scan like this or understanding what's happening, you can't, you really can't accurately address those issues because you're guessing. And if you take just a snapshot in time, we all know things change from a day-to-day -day basis. It, it's, it moves so quickly, like that doesn't stay accurate very long. And then just one other thing is about the contracts super important to be looking over your contracts because the contracts themselves with these providers with these with these companies depending on how they're framed could make it that you know you may not have sufficient protections in there if there's sensitive data let's say around kids or something but they say oh you know we don't we don't we don't consider kappa your provider but you know that your app 
is a kid's app, that's going to be a major issue. And it could implicate other elements outside of this. So anyway, there, there's a lot going on there. But the point is, all of this goes into your risk management. All this goes into your data governance structure. It's so important to build this out so that you're prepared that if you get an inquiry or if there's an action against you, et cetera, this will help you with, with your defense. Awesome. And Daniel, just on this point, actually, there's a larger question in the Q&A. It's about, it's kind of what you pointed out. The, the, if I just kind of rephrase the question, it's about, did you, do you also find a lot of organizations don't have DPAs or these, in, maybe in US service provider agreements with large, larger platforms? And their experience has been that people just signed up, you know, ages ago, created an account and started ads. What's your experience been? And, and, and if you can also answer, like, what can companies do now? Once they run the Privado scan, they get all the, yeah. if they identify everything, then what should be the step? So it's, so actually, I think you would find that you do have a, a data processing addendums with these companies, with these platforms, because they, they tend to update it. It's just unilateral updates. And one of the concerns, so getting into the technical elements of it is how have they defined themselves? Are they a processor? Are they a controller? Can they use the data for their own purposes? If they are not allowed to use the data for their own purposes, right, they're a processor. And if they are not doing targeted advertising, cross-context behavioral or profiling, then you're probably going to be in a situation where you're okay because we can really classify them as a service provider, right? And you have the sufficient protections. But what we've seen with a lot of these companies is they go, actually, we are a controller of the data or we are a third party or they say they're a service provider, but they're really a third party because they're doing targeted advertising. And that's the exact thing that gets companies in a lot of trouble unless they have the opt out or the opt in for sensitive types of data. So again, going back to like COPPA or something, you know, COPPA allows for disclosures if it is for an, the support for internal operations. So you can get a device identifier for like that one reason. But if that data is being used for other purposes and it's being repurposed for targeted advertising, for example, or you don't have that restriction that says it can only be used for this purpose, you could find yourself in violation of the law. So the answer is it's really hard for most of these large tech vendors. You can't send them a DPA because they're going to say ours applies. So you got to do due diligence for smaller companies. I think it's in part particularly important to conduct due diligence on these companies because a lot of them have very simple terms and are just not that sophisticated. There's a lot of SDKs out there. And, and that's one reason why Apple's cracking down on this. And that's why we're seeing all this stuff about the privacy manifests. All right. Awesome. And we're right on the time. Thanks, Daniel, for the amazing insights today. Thanks, everyone, for joining in. And everyone have a rest good of the day. Bye-bye. Thank you so much for having me today. Really, really enjoyed it. And if anyone has any questions, please feel free to reach out. Take care. Bye. Thank you.